Good evening, everyone. We can begin with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank and praise you for this evening and have you blessed us. And we pray, Lord God, as we look into your word, that you will open it before us, help us to understand it, give us insight in it, make us wise according to it, so that we could obey your will. We thank you, we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. So we are in Revelation uh, chapter 6 today, verses 1 through 17. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 17. You might recall we were talking about the structure of the book. Uh, a lot of Revelation has numbered items that are listed one after the other. For example, last week we mentioned the seven seals. You're also going to see there are seven trumpets and seven vials. Um, for this reason, uh, one might be tempted to view such as consecutive events over time, as in, you know, what occurred first and then second and then third and so on. The problem with this approach is that there are passages in the Revelation uh, that show that some of those events are happening at the same time, that is, they are concurrent with each other rather than consecutive. For example, uh, the fact that saints are being martyred in that time is happening throughout the entire time period, even though it's shown only after the opening of the fifth seal. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, whether or not the symbols of Revelation are concurrent or whether they are consecutive depend upon the context of the passage uh, in which those symbols occur. There is not a one-size-fits-all method of interpreting Revelation here, because Revelation is a combination of apocalyptic narrative and poetic structure. In the little uh, box on the sidebar, I have there describing apocalyptic literature. And of course, we mentioned before that the word apocalypse, you know, the apocalypse is the Greek word for revelation. And so when we talk about apocalyptic literature in the Bible, we're referring to that literature that resembles the book of Revelation. Uh, you often have a future event, often uh, or a future, a future time, often cataclysmic events that lead to a complete transformation of the world in which evil is destroyed and God's will finally wins over. Um, you'll see a large amount of symbols and, and, and th that's visual and also literary, and it makes it difficult to understand. You can find that kind of literature also in books like Joel, uh, Isaiah, or uh, Zechariah. Uh, for example, and all these contain apocalyptic literature. I think it is among the most difficult to interpret and understand. There are a lot of books written about it, a lot of scholars write, but when you read these scholars, you see them quoting each other. There seems to be not too much any original, original scholarship. And so for that reason, I tend not to quote a lot of the scholars unless they can demonstrate uh, why they're saying what they're saying. They have to be able to prove it from the text itself. So uh, we deal with, in chapter six, first of all, uh, the first of a series of three judgments. The three judgments we mentioned last week were seals, trumpets, and vials. The, uh, uh, these judgments are basically markers of the great tribulation. It's how you know that we're in, that you are going through great tribulation. The living creatures, which you mentioned the seraphim back in chapter five, they are instrumental in unveiling those judgments in that each, as each seal is open, a seraph calls forth the judgment, which is symbolized by one of the four horsemen. We're gonna talk about that. They use the word come, and it suggests that each seraph calls forth a particular judgment. So we look at some of the judgment in verses one, three, five, and also verse seven. Uh, verse one, verse three, verse five, in verse seven, let me go there for a minute real quick. Revelation chapter six, verses, uh, verses one, three, five, and seven. Can I, can I get someone to read verse one there, chapter six, verse one? Now I, now, watched when the, go ahead. Go ahead. now I watched when the lamb opened one of the seven seals and I heard one of the 
four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come. Right. And what he's doing is he's 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 kind of commanding the judgments to come, more or less. How about uh, Revelation 6, 3? When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. All right. So you see the same thing happening again. How about Revelation 6, 5? Anyone? When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. And I looked and behold, a black horn. And his rider had a pair of scales in his hand. Thank you. And we'll, we'll deal with this in more detail as we go on in today's lesson. Verse 7 says, and when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. That, that's happening here in the beginning of these judgments. These, as the seal's being opened by the lamb, these angels are calling it out. Basically they're saying, come, like, like they're telling the judgments to, uh, to come. And you, you notice how John lists the voices of the living creature in numerical order. He says he saw the first, the second, the third, and the fourth, and so on. The first seal, which is dealing with conquest, it says, now I watched when the lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a loud voice like thunder, or, uh, with a voice like thunder, rather, come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. Its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Historical background here, and we said before that when we look at Revelation, we will try our best to look at it through the eyes of the Apostle John, who is a, who is a believer. He, his background, he's a Jewish believer. He's an apostle. He's also living in the Roman Empire. And basically, white horses were used by Romans to denote victory. So that's not a coincidence that it said he saw the rider on a white horse and he came out conquering. John will be able to identify that. Ah, he has to conquer on a white horse because to the Roman in the Roman Empire, white horses denoted winning, denoted victory. The rider's horse is giving a Stephanus. We talk about the victor's crown, not a not a diadem. Right? A diadem would be like what Queen Elizabeth wears, you know, the crown with the jewels in it and so forth. The victor's crown is like a wreath, you know, the olive wreath. They replace on your head when you want a race, for example, when you want a contest. In this case, this, this white horse represents victories, representing conquest. And so he is given this Stephanus, this crown. And it says he came out to conquer. That's the idea there. At first glance, one thinks about war when you think about conquest. But war is a symbol of the red horse, which is second seal. So this horse isn't referencing war, but it is referencing conquest. And it's a reference to peace that follows conquest. There are, there are two ways to win a war or, or to win a, a, a contest. One way is to fight. Another way is just to get the guy to agree to surrender. Right. And this is this is what's happening is the white horse is coming and his conquest is he's going to bring about world peace. That's the idea there. And so it symbolizes this peace, at least temporarily. Let's look at some passages here that that'll that'll buttress the same thing. It'll go to uh, Daniel 9, 24 and 27, Jeremiah 14 and First Thessalonians 15. We'll revisit Daniel again a, a couple of times, actually. <clears throat> oh, let's see. In fact, I don't want to go to Daniel first. Let's go to uh, Jeremiah first. Can someone read Jeremiah 14, 13 to 15? Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them, You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine. But I will give you assurance, assured peace in this place. And the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them to speak, nor did I command them or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision worthless divination and the deceit of their own minds. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets 
who prophesy in my name, although I did not send them, and who say, sword and famine shall not come upon this land. By sword and famine, those prophets shall be consumed. Thank you. Now, this was happening at the time just before the Babylonians conquered Israel. These false prophets were saying, we're good. We have the temple. We have the Ark of the Covenant. God's on our side. Nobody can beat us. Peace and safety, peace and safety. That's what they were saying, right? And of course, God saying they're lying. The very thing they promised won't happen will happen. It's going to, it's going to destroy them. And so uh, uh, now the reason why I go back here is because it is this passage that that Thessalonians is going to be quoting from. You, oftentimes, you'll see dual applications of the same passage in the Old Testament. We'll be talking about one thing back in the Old Testament, but actually pointing to something else. And here we go to uh, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 3, because I want to read that. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they right. will not escape. Thank you. And so you have the second coming of Christ. You have the end. The day of the Lord will come all of a sudden while people are saying, we're good peace and safety, nothing bad, we resolved all the problems, just as those false pro prophets did back in, uh, back in uh, Jeremiah's time. And do I want to read that yet? No, not yet. Oh, there it is. Yeah, J uh, Daniel chapter 9, 9, and we'll talk about this l later on, but Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, referring to the Antichrist. It says, he will make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. We'll talk more about that in a, in a few minutes, prayerfully. But basically, he's referring to some future time period, right? We'll talk about how the phrase week is actually referring to a period of seven years. I'm going to show that out in the Hebrew. And, and there's a period where there's a, there's a seven-year period he's speaking about, right? But halfway through that period, there's this person who's going to break a treaty, a covenant he makes. And when he breaks that covenant, all the peace will be gone, basically. And, and that's the idea, though. When he comes, he'll come bringing peace, but he won't finish in peace. He'll start with peace. It'll seem like everything's great. This guy will solve the world's problems, right? And then he'll bring around uh, destruction. Of course, that is not to say that people who are peacemakers are not to be trusted. I see a lot of Christians do that. When some world leader comes along with some peace plan, a lot of Christians are automatically distrusted. And that's not, that's not good. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, right? Making peace is not a bad thing. While we know that the end will come, it'll be a cataclysmic time where we're praying always for peace all the time. So peace is something we should always hope for, but don't, don't so we don't want to confuse a prophecy and let the prophecy make us think that therefore peacemakers shouldn't be trusted. I know people who actually say that. Every time that I remember when, uh, who was it? Jimmy Carter uh, brought the Egyptians and the, and the uh, Israelis to the table at Camp David, Camp David Accords, and they signed a peace treaty. And there were folks out there saying, well, Carter must be the Antichrist. He got Israel at peace with an enemy. Well, if that's the case, the same thing would be true of Donald Trump, who brought Israel to peace with several of her enemies, about four of them, I believe, before he left office, right? So just because someone brings peace, that doesn't mean they are necessarily the Antichrist. Bringing peace is one of the signs, but it'll be much different. And in, in, in basically, the uh, you'll be able to know in three and a half years after it all starts, basically. But until then, you know, with it, be very careful using newspapers to interpret the Bible rather than the Bible interpret the Bible. But some takeaways here is that the tribulation period will begin with a time of peace and prosperity. The white horse is not a person any more than the other horses, but rather it is peace itself will be held as a victor. The Antichrist is involved here, but he's not yet being personified. Uh, the peace will be broken halfway through. We referenced that a little bit in Daniel, 24, uh, Daniel 9. And in fact, let me read the Holman Christian Standard Bible on that one. 
on Daniel 9, uh, 27. Twenty fourth of twenty seven. Let me see. Now remember the Hebrew here was was a bit better. Now I'll read it myself. It says seventy weeks are decreed, and actually that word "reek" is a word for seven. It's actually saying seventy sevens are decreed, right? About your people, your holy city, to bring the rebellion to an end, to put a stop to sin, to wipe away iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this, that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, which equals, by the way, 69. It will be rebuilt with a plaza and a moat, but at difficult times. After those 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and will have nothing. The coming, uh, uh, the people of the coming Prince will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come with a flood. And until the end, there will be war. Desolations will be decreed. Then it says he'll make a firm covenant with many for a week. But in the middle of the week, he'll put a stop to sacrifice and offering. And the abomination of desolation will be a wing upon the temple and, uh, until the decreed destruction is poured out on the desolator. All right, there's a lot there. And I don't want to get into a study on oh. Daniel. You know, I don't want to get into a study on Daniel because that gets bogged down. We want to, we're studying Revelation. But just real quick, as I said before, the word weak there is the same word in Hebrew as the word for seven. So he's not referring to 77 day weeks, but rather 70 periods of, of seven years. Oh, each week each week represents a seven year period. That's how I know that. Right. So so basically he starts off with 49 years in verse 24. And when the 49 years are over, the city is basically being rebuilt. Right. Uh, uh, Artaxerxes will issue a decree and then 483 years later, that's what you get, we multiply 62 times 7, 483 years later, the Messiah comes. And when you when you date that stuff from Artaxerxes to Jesus, it comes down almost to the day when he entered the city on Palm Sunday, right? And then after that, it says he's cut off, he dies. Now, he begins by saying there are 70 weeks of decree, but in the text, he only mentions 69 of them. What happens to the seventh week? What happens in the seventh week is what you see near the end where it says that the, this person, whoever it is, will make a covenant with many for a week. That is for seven years. But in the middle, at the three and a half years, he'll stop them basically from their sacrifices. You, you have here a picture of Israel and this person making a peace treaty, right? And they will go back into doing the things they did in their, in their law, but he's going to bring it to a stop. He's going to do something horrible when they realize that this isn't the Messiah at all. And then a lot of trouble will get started. And as we go into the book of Revelation, you'll see a lot of persecution of saints begin and things like that. But that's the entire idea about how he'll start with peace and safety. He'll seem like a nice guy, but he won't be in the end. That's the first seal. The second seal is war. I'm sorry. Are there any questions there? Hmm. Anyone else have any questions? All right. Well, the second seal is war. It says, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. Let's go to Mark chapter 13, verses 5 and 8. Mark 13, 5 and 8. Or seven through eight. Can uh, I guess I want to read that, please? When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. These things must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pain. Thank you. So Mark 13, I think also Matthew 24, 25, you know, it, it's a place where Jesus is answering the disciples' questions. How will we know when the end is coming? Right. So he, he starts mentioning all these signs, you know, and he goes, so now, you know, the end isn't when you see these signs, don't worry. The end isn't yet. 
He mentions there'll be all kinds of stuff before the end comes, but he calls these signs the beginning of birth pains. You know, it's the way a, a woman would know her baby's coming because she's having birth pains. It doesn't mean it'll be born that minute, but it's a reminder that there's a baby on the way. And of course, in this case, the baby coming on the way is the coming of Jesus Christ, right? And so here in Revelation, we saw that the second writer is, is war, is conflict. He takes peace from the earth. The third seal is famine. Can someone read verses five and six, please? When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. And I looked and behold, a black horse. And its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and wine. Thank you. Let's go to Matthew 24, verse seven. I said before that Matthew 24, you know, uh, Jesus Christ is giving his own word on the last days and what, what things will happen before the end comes. I meant to go back my version here. All right, can someone read that, verse 7? For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. So John, of course, is seeing the same thing that uh, that uh, uh, he's seeing, in, rather uh, uh, that that Jesus had already said. He's not repeating Jesus in the sense that he remember what Jesus said, but rather he's saying what what uh, 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 or rather we're seeing what Jesus had said being fulfilled, right? Because he's looking at a vision of the future, and what he's seeing here is famine. A measure, when he says uh, a quart of wheat or a measure of wheat for denarius, right? A denarius was a day's wage for an unskilled laborer at that time. If we contextualize this for today, um, in the United States, that's equivalent to about $72.50. I just took that by saying, well, the federal minimum wage is $7.25, seven, $7 right? Over a 10-hour workday, that's seventy-two fifty. So if we want to think about what stuff what stuff may cost, right? A day's wage. If things were happening right now, that's this is one of the reasons why I know it's not happening yet. Not right now around the world, but if we're happening right now, you could imagine buying some grain or barley or a loaf of bread for eighty bucks, seventy bucks. You know that that's that's the idea there, right? The idea of don't hurt the the oil or the wine to, to kind of show their their rashing it they're trying to spare because those are very very valuable things but but you'll have a rise a, a great rise in prices this nine percent inflation we have right now is nothing we've had that before we had that back in uh, uh, uh the 19 or early 1980s 19 1978 1980 when inflation went up to nine ten eleven percent so this is this isn't new and there are other countries have inflation rates up in the thousands of percent but here we see that it will take the entire day's wage is just to buy a little bit. The command, the command from the living creatures to the rider of Black Horse saying, don't harm the oil or wine, as I said before, suggests a restriction because of the severity of shortage, else the famine will be far worse, right? That's, you know, famine is caused like this. Here's some takeaways. Uh, a denarius was a day's wage. I mentioned that already. Oh, wrong, wrong thing. The price, the prices of basic staples, and you have in the Near East, uh, uh, wheat, barley, oil, and wine were staples, will be so high that common people will not be able to buy them. Common people, the, the regular folks who are not wealthy, very rich. Um, uh, famine follows war, you know, because prices rise as crops are destroyed and food distribution systems are disrupted which leads to mass hunger. That Every time a war happens, even right now, we see that happening in different places around the world. When a mm -hmm. war happens, people go hungry. Why? Because you can't deliver food anymore. Look at what's happening in the Ukraine or anywhere else in the world There has where war has, has hit, right? You always, it's, it's always followed by people starving. No matter what country it is, if they're hard enough, no matter how fast they are, 
you know, they starve. It happened in Germany, happened in England, happened in France, happened in Japan, happened all over the world, right? Anywhere where war hits hard, people starve. Um, the fourth seal is death. He says, oh, I'm sorry, are there any questions at that at this point? I don't have any prepared out because I'm, I'm going through this, but do you have any questions at all? Mm -mm. All right, well, it's, the fourth seal is death. It says, when he opened the fourth seal, I'll read this myself, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. And I looked and behold, a pale horse and his rider's name was death and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over the fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence, the wild beasts of the earth. And so we're gonna look at some of these passages here from Ezekiel, uh, we're gonna compare Ezekiel 14, 20, 12 to 23 with the, with the Revelation 6, 8, where we are. Someone read this please. And the word, and the word, go ahead. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, when a land sins against me by acting faithfully, faithlessly, I can't see. Hold on a minute. Can you see it now? No. Um, so for some reason, somebody else, why don't someone else start to read? And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, when a land sins against me by acting faithlessly, and I stretch out my hand against it and break its supply of bread and send famine upon it and cut off from it man and beast, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver but their own lives by their righteousness declares the Lord God. If I cause wild beasts to pass through the land and they ravage it and it be made desolate so that no one may pass through because of the beasts, even if these three men were in it, as I live, declares the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters they alone would be delivered but the land would be desolate or if i bring a sword upon that land and say let a sword pass through the land and i cut off from it man and beast though these three men were in it as i live declares the lord god they would deliver neither sons nor daughters but they would but they alone would be delivered. Or if I send a pestilence into the land and pour out my wrath upon it, the blood to cut off from it man and beast, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, declares the Lord God, they would, de they would deliver neither son nor daughters. They would, de they would deliver but their own lives by their righteousness. For thus says the Lord God, how much more when I send upon Jerusalem my four disastrous acts of judgment, sword, famine, wild beast, and pestilence, to cut off from it man and beast. But behold, some survivors will be left in it, sons and daughters who will be brought out. Behold, when they come out to you, and you see their ways and their deeds, you will be consoled for the disaster that I have brought upon Jerusalem. For all that I have brought upon it, they will console you when you see their ways and their deeds, and you shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, declares the Lord God. Thank you. And all this is telling us is that when he sends this stuff, he's not wiping everybody out. He will spare the righteous, right? That's why he mentions Daniel, Noah, and Job. They were known to be righteous men. He goes, even if they were alive, I'm still taking you out. They'll just save themselves. I won't even save their children. 
only they will be spared. And then he, he sums it all up in the end when it says some survivors will be left in it. That is verse 22. Sons will be brought out. When they come out to you, you'll see their ways and their deeds. You'll be consoled. What's going on here is, you know, you know that not all is lost. These people are living because they were righteous. Oh, we should be righteous. That's, that's the picture there, right? And we're going to see here, we, we look at that passage and notice he mentions the four ways he's killing them. Where, where is it at? He's bringing, uh, he's bringing uh, a wild beast. He's bringing sword. He's bringing pestilence. And he's bringing famine, right? Famine mm -hmm. is hunger. Wild beasts, well, those are just wild animals. Sword, that's the war. And pestilence is disease or plague. We look back at the text we're reading back here in uh, Revelation chapter 6, and it says he gives authority to, over the fourth of the earth to kill a sword and famine and pestilence, a wild beast. Okay? This is not a coincidence that, that John is mentioning the same methods of dying as Ezekiel because it's the one mind of God inspiring both, both men. Right, inspiring both John the Apostle and the prophet Ezekiel, to talking about referencing somewhat the same idea. Although, although Ezekiel is referring to what's going to happen to Israel when, this, when the Assyrians come, that still is a way of reflecting forward. You, you look at that passage referring to Israel and you reflect forward, you see some lessons about the end of the world. And oftentimes, a lot of prophecies, prophecies in the Old Testament are dual. They mean what they meant at that time, but the point is something else in his final fulfillment, right? This horse, it says it's pale. The word chloros is a word that means pale green. What word does that remind you of that you think of as green? Chlorophyll. Chlorophyll, chlorophyll. that's right. We get our word chlorophyll from that word chloros, right? Chlorophyll, it, 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 it's simply a word that means pale green. That's that's the idea there. And uh so, so you have that 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 picture, pale green. It kind of reminds you of someone who's sick. Death follows war and famine. Hades, which is the grave, follows death. There's a word picture he's painting here, an image he wants you to think about. An old corpse, which is pale and ashen, being followed by a grave digger. This is, this is the image that's supposed to come to your minds. He says he gives authority, that Greek word exousia means he gives permission to take one fourth of all human life. If this happened today, two billion people would be dead. I went to the United Nations uh, site. I grabbed the uh, population data for 2022. And there are just someone has their TV on or something in the background. Yes. Anyway, I, I, I grabbed the population uh, uh, numbers. And I saw that there are 8 billion people on earth right now. And so if this prophecy were being fulfilled right now, 2 billion people will die. That's a lot of people, right? Mm -hmm. Now, whenever this prophecy is fulfilled, the population could be larger or might be smaller, you know, but nevertheless, whatever population is at the time this is being fulfilled, a fourth of them will die. And the way they die, we mentioned before, is by sword, that's war, famine, that's hunger, pestilence, some versions of the Bible say death, but it translates out as plague or uh, a pandemic. That's the idea there. Uh, 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 the current pandemic we just experienced ain't it. It didn't kill one-fourth of all the people, right? It's still a pandemic, but not as bad as this future one coming. Wild beasts, they're a threat to human life, maybe because they're in competition with man for food. You know, remember that the worldwide resources are scarce. So they turn on man as a food source, or maybe to eliminate uh, a competitor for food and territory, the way lions and hyenas fight each other all the time. We're fighting over the scraps. Like in Israel, he said, people might not go through the land because of the wild beasts that are running around everywhere. All right, but that's the fourth seal. Are there any questions there? Uh, it's not a question, but just an observation that I have. Um, you know, all of so far we have seen that God is the one acting here. I mean, bringing this judgment upon the land. And uh, I was just thinking through it, and I'm seeing that you know, man can really. It just shows that when God acts, we really don't have control. God is the one that that punishes. Is the one that saves. 
And it, what I'm what is just going through my mind is the fact that if God, if with all of these judgments that we are seeing, man can really do nothing. Because right. it's like God is really angry here, yeah, so to speak. So it, right. that's a picture. So it, at the same time, I'm just thinking, I think this is where we can we can when we like when we pray and ask God for mercy for yeah. to turn our hearts back onto him. It is God that can turn our hearts back and make people right. desire him, kind of. So for yeah. me, it's, it's just a challenge, you know, you know, to just pray for God's mercy. Even for my, even for us as individuals, it is not in us to to Paul says what I want to do, you know, I do things I don't want to do. So it's really God that enables us, makes us to will and to mm-hmm. do his will. That's right. Am I making sense? Yes, you are. And the so thing I, is, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I think in a way, I mean, there's that fear, the whoa, you need to fear this God. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, it's also an encouragement to pray and, and seek on right. behalf of others, our family members, you know, other people, yeah. because like in this passage, even the, it says the people will be saved, but not their children. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, that's yeah. just what is going through my right. mind. And, and God will always extend mercy to people who ask. But mm-hmm. bear in mind, this is the tribulation period. That's the end of his mercy. Right. This is at the point where there's no more mercy anymore. He's about to end the world. And it's not going to end nicely. Right? This, this is at a time when people really realize he's had enough. That's it. You're done. At the end of this period, people will be going to hell. There's no, okay, I'll let you out now. This, this is not... Let's come. Let's let Israel come back into their nation, and that kind of thing. That's not. That's not happening here. People are dying. People who die here will simply go to hell. The only way to salvation here, like like any other time, is to come to Christ, right? But people coming to Christ, even in that time period, won't stop these things from happening because they're they're prophecies. They have to happen. That's the idea. We, we, we will not forswear, or we cannot forestall God's wrath at this point. You know what I mean? However, people can escape the wrath being poured on everybody else if they themselves uh, they themselves repent, although they'll probably find themselves being killed in the hand of the Antichrist. It's like, you know, you're going to die one or the other, but better die and go to heaven and die and go to hell. Uh, but we'll get to that as we go on. But that, that's a good point. It, still, but even today, though, as things happen, we know it's always in God's hands and we still have to keep praying for mercy. We always pray for peace, right? There's that prayer. You know, uh, shalom, shalom, Yerushalayim, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, right? So we always pray, you know, people are wicked, but we pray for their salvation. That's always, that's always the case. We leave the outcome up to God. So thank you. Any other questions there or comments? The fifth seal, because we'll read verses nine and 10. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on these who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Yeah, one of the most sobering statements I ever read in the Bible is this one. Wait until the rest of you die. I mean, that's what he says, isn't it? Wait until the num- number of brothers and servants should be killed. Yep. You know, then his vengeance comes out. But a lot of a lot of believers at the time are going to die first, right? They're going to die, and then his wrath will come. And, and when you see, remember I said before that although these seals are being opened in a certain order, that doesn't mean these judgments are happening in the same order because they're happening all through the tribulation period. You know what I mean? This is just showing what those judgments are. So we're seeing we're seeing the judgments revealed in the order, but when they actually happen, it'll be happening throughout the tribulation period, particularly after the second uh, three and a half years, basically. Uh, uh, the, the Antichrist will be killing God's saints and God will be responding with all of these all of these these judgments, and we're going to see later on in the book. And yet, for all that, they would not repent. They would not repent. They would not repent. 
you know, we'll, we'll keep seeing that, right? And so let's go to Matthew 24. I don't know if I want to read all 10 verses. Let me take a look at it first. Well, maybe, maybe we do. Let's see if it's the one I'm talking about. Uh, we read some of this. Let's read verses 9, 9 through 13. Hold on, let me get that thing right again. Can someone read this, please? Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Thank you. And this is that a parallel passage to the one we read earlier in Luke, referring to the signs of the ends. And he says, you'll be hated. Uh, a lot of people are going to fall away. They'll betray each other, turning each other in. You know, picture that. People who don't have the mark, you will know, be turned in by, by people who thought were their brothers and sisters. There'll be a lot of false teachers. They'll lead people astray. And lawlessness, sin, will be, will be increased. You'll have an increase of sin and violence. People won't love each other. He goes, but the one who endures, he'll, that'll be the one who saved. Don't, don't give up, he's going to tell them. Don't give up. H hang in there. Be faithful unto death, he told the one church. Now, give you a crown of life, right? And that, that's, the, that's the idea here. But it's going to be a bad time period when all this is going on. Um, where are we at here? Uh, so it mentions the altar. It says, as we learned earlier, heaven with the throne, living creatures, and so forth, is the pattern after which the earthly tabernacle was built. There are two altars associated with the earthly tabernacle. One was the altar of sacrifice. This is where they killed the animal. That they, 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 they put it up there. They took a dagger and they stabbed it. You know what I mean? Out, just outside the, uh, uh, outside the temple uh, uh, holy place. Then there was the altar of incense. This altar was located inside the Holy of Holies where they constantly burned incense. Of the two, the altar of incense is the one probably represented here, where these people were under the altar crying out for vengeance because it's associated with prayer. The martyrs are praying, and as a result of their prayer, God is sending judgment. That's the idea there. They're saying, you know, we're told, for example, do not avenge yourselves. But then he goes on to say, vengeance belongs to God. So they're asking God, avenge us, avenge us. And God says, well, wait until the number is complete of who's going to die. Um, if you look at Revelation chapter 8, we'll jump ahead to the opening of the seventh seal. I don't know why, why my thing didn't do that correctly. Can I get someone to read chapter 8, verses 1 through 5? When the, lamb, go go ahead. Ahead. when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given set incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth, and there were pails of thunder, rumblings, flashings of lightning, and an earthquake. Thank you. So back in chapter 6, you had these martyred Christians, these martyred believers. They've been killed for their faith, asking God for vengeance. And the Bible uses the phrase, their souls were under the altar. Here it shows that this altar is an altar of incense. It says he stood at the altar with a golden censer. That's a, a, a thing in which you burn incense. And 
he was given much incense to offer the president of the saints. Notice what it says. He filled the censer uh, uh, and filled it with fire from the altar, which he used to burn incense with. And he threw it on the earth. It's the picture of what the, what the people on earth is getting is a result of what's burning on the altar. That is, the saints' prayers are being heard. They're crying for vengeance. It's symbolized by the altar of incense that represents prayer. And they're taking their prayer and they're throwing it to the earth, showing this is why I'm doing this. You persecuted my people and I've had enough. That's the, that's the, that's the big, big picture there. Let's go to, uh, I think it's Psalm 141. Someone read uh, uh, verses 1 and 2, please. O oh Lord, I call upon you. Hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Okay, you notice that how verse 2 is. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you. This is not just coincidence here, right? It's a picture of incense rising before God. We said before that incense and the altar of incense represents the prayers of the people, prayer of the saints. So he says, let my prayer be counted as incense. It's rising up to you. Hear me. Please listen to me. And that's what David is crying, right? And so you see that with that particular uh, that particular uh, uh, seal. This was the fifth seal. Uh, uh, you, it talks about they are souls. Their bodies have not yet been resurrected. They're crying out for vengeance. They were given white robes, right? Which is what uh, believers are promised. And they are told to rest, just, just wait for a while until everything gets fulfilled. Are there any questions there? Hmm. All right, the sixth seal, can someone read verses uh, 12, and four, 12 to 14, please? When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, and the, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Okay, I mentioned apocalyptic literature. You, you don't get more apocalyptic than this, right? Great earthquake. The sun became black. The moon became like blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth. Fig tree sheds its winter fruit. The sky vanished. And every mountain I was moving, you know, this is the end of everything, basically. This six seal shows us the end of the world, right? That's why I said, now... The end of the world won't happen yet until the seven years are over, actually until millennium is over, but it's coming. The sixth seal simply shows John what's going to happen. You know, it is it is one of the judgments is your world's coming to an end. I'm going to end everything. Nothing will be the same ever again. And let's look at some passages here. I have uh, several of them we can look at. Isaiah 34, 4. So I want to read that. All the hosts of heaven shall rot away, and the skies roll up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall, as leaves fall from the vine, like leaves falling from the fig tree. Yeah, and you see what we just read in Revelation. It's almost <laughs> quoting this, almost, almost word for word. I'll read, I'll read from Joel. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour up my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants. In those days I'll pour up my spirit. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. Blood and fire, columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness. The moon to blood. And before the great and awesome day the Lord comes. What's interesting here is that on the day of Pentecost. Which is the beginning of the church. Way back some 49, 50 days after the resurrection. After the crucifixion. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, and for the first time, God indwelt his people. He was always here. He would use people for a bit, but now he's indwelling everybody, not just priests, not just prophets, but every believer. That's why he mentions, I'll pour my spirit on all flesh. Then he gives some examples. Your sons and your daughters prophesying. Your old men dream dreams. Your young men see visions. 
male and female servants are poor of my spirit. Slaves, men, women, young, old, if they're my people, are getting the Holy Spirit. That's that's the point. They're going, they're going to be filled by the Holy Spirit. And that, that started its, its fulfillment back there on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. But then he goes on. This part, verse 30, hasn't happened yet. Wanders in the heavens and the earth, fire, columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, moon to blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So the, the last days began with, with, the, with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, from the time Jesus came and left, when he left and day of Pentecost came, that began the beginning of the last days. From that time on, people have been living in the last days, right? Nothing had, there's nothing left to happen from the time of the day of Pentecost. There was nothing that had to happen before he come back. Another reason why we don't want to interpret the Bible with the newspaper. People say things like, well, you know, now he can do things because of computer, name it, computer chips, QR codes, cryptocurrency, barcodes, telephones, computers, um, uh, 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 telegraph machines. Every time a new invention got started, there's some Christian out there saying, aha, now the Antichrist can come. He could have come way back in AD 35, right? There was no more prophecy. It needs to happen before he comes. Nothing. This day of the Lord can happen anytime. The Bible says it happens as a thief in the night. You will not expect it, right? You don't expect it. He could show up at any time when all these, these, these events will suddenly start occurring and everybody will be surprised, okay? But that's the idea. So the, so the, the last days began way back at the beginning, at the beginning of the church, at, at the day of Pentecost. And the last days will end when Jesus Christ brings it to an end, when he rolls up the sky like a scroll and brings the world to an end, right? So, uh, but the sign of the end of the last days are these terrible, terrible disasters. Um, hold on. How about uh, 2 Peter 7, or 3, rather, 7 to 12? Can somebody read that one? But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in li lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolve, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? Thank you. So Peter here is talking about, again, the end of the world. He says, the heavens and the earth are being stored up for fire. Kind of like we told Abraham, when Abraham and Lot had a disagreement uh, over the land. And Abraham says, look, I'll tell you what, you pick the land you want, I'll pick the other land. And the Bible says that a lot picked the better part down in the plain where Sodom and Gomorrah were, left Abraham up in the rocks. And then God promised Abraham, he says, look, know for certain that you will die in this place, Abraham, but your descendants will go be slaves in another country for a while. But then they'll come back here. And he says, because my, my, my judgment against the Canaanites isn't, isn't filled up yet. Basically, the Canaanites where Abraham was living was a wicked place, the land of Canaan. And he's waiting for them to get so bad that when he issues his judgment, no one will question his judgment. That's the case of being stored up for fire. When everything happens, nobody can say, we didn't deserve this, right? So as time marches on, basically... He's letting people incriminate themselves every time they don't repent. It's getting worse and worse and worse. The bit about thousand years and thousands of day, he's not trying to give us a ratio. People started doing that stuff with the 7,000 year timeline. Well, that expired 10 years ago, right? Another reason why you don't, you don't trust people who start trying to give you dates. That expired. Those people are all false prophets, right? 
this idea of saying a day is a thousand, thousand years a day. It's like in, in Hebrews are saying a thousand years a day. What's this? What's the difference to God? That's the way it is, right? There's no difference to him. It's all the same, right? We we read too much into the passage. He's not making a ratio. He's just saying one or the other is all the same to God. You know, God's not slow. God is patient. He's waiting for people to repent. That's the idea there. But when it comes, they'll come like a thief. Notice what he says in verse 11 and 12. He asked that question. Since you know all this, what kind of people, what kind of lives should you be living? And he said this to people who were around almost 2,000 years ago. He told them to live as if the day of the Lord is coming in their lifetime. He doesn't say to them, well, don't worry. It'll be a few thousand years before it happens. They had no idea what would happen. Just we don't have any idea. It might happen tomorrow. It might happen in another thousand. I don't know. But we should live as if it's going to happen tomorrow. It, it, it always, always, we learn these things. It should point us to living holy and godly lives. That's what the point is. We, we said we read Revelation, not just so we could be fascinated by the future, so that we would know what kind of lives we should live, right? It says, blessed are those who, 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 are, who hear, who heed this word, and blessed are those who read, right? It's not referring to us reading it. It's referring to the person reading it to other people. That's, we talked about that in the, in the very first chapter, right? It's someone reading publicly to others, and the others hearing what's being read and obeying what it's saying. The blessing is, as we hear what's being said, we are obeying what we learn. The blessing of the person reading is they're reading it to other people. Just reading it by yourself. That's not the point. That is not the point, right? He's referring to that experience of people coming together and sharing the word of God and learning and, and obeying it. That's the whole point. Uh, and the point I'm making here, of course, is that the Bible repeats itself. Uh, uh, Revelation said the same thing that Peter said. Same thing that same thing that uh, that uh, uh, Joel said. Let's go to uh, chapter twenty, verse eleven. It says here. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who seated on it, and from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. This is going to happen at the end of time, at the end of the millennium, but yet it's being revealed in this seal, this fifth seal, right? So these seals, uh, although they're happening after each other, I'm oh, sorry, the sixth seal, they're happening after each other. They're not referring to events that happen one, then the other, then the other. You understand? He's just showing us, in, he's just showing us what's happening, but not showing us what's happening first, second, and third. You know, he can't show us all at the same time. Our mind works linearly. It works first, second, and third, but that's not how it happens. When these things happen, they'll be happening somewhat at the same time. And the end of the world happens at the very end of all this, even though he's not done with all the seals yet. Are there any questions here? And so I have here, I want you to note that the destruction of the heavens and the earth precede the judgment of Christ at the great white throne. Again, the timing of the events in these judgments will not necessarily occur in the order of the seal openings. You know, the seal, for example, this one points to the end of the time, although it's opened near the beginning of the book of Revelation. Verses 15, 16, and 17 says, Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks and the mountains calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who seated on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. Who can stand? Luke makes the same point, basically. People will cry out. They'll run to the rocks. In fact, let's go there. Luke uh, 23. And uh, maybe I didn't want to go there. That's, 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 this, this is Jesus being Jesus being crucified. Let me see.
Oh, that's it. Can someone, uh, I'll, I'll read it. It says, as for these things that you see, the days will come where there will not be one stone upon another, referring to the temple, that will not be thrown down. They asked him, teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he says, see that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am he. And they'll say, the time is at hand. Don't go after them. A lot of folks are saying that. This is it. This is the end. This is the end times. Because what happened over, what happened over, name the country, Ukraine, Israel, whatever. Right? He says, don't go after them. When you hear of wars and tumults, don't be terrified, for these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places, famines and pestilences. There will be terrors and great signs from heaven. Uh, but before all this, they will lay their hands upon you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You'll be brought before kings and governors for my namesake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. He doesn't say, whatever you do, try to escape. He says, you have a chance to witness. Sell it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which you are, none of which your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up, even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. But by your endurance, you will gain your life. That's interesting. You'll be put to death, but you won't perish, because perishing is different than just dying. There's, there's, a death, there's a death worse than the physical one, right? He says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know that desolation has come near. Then let those who in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who inside the city depart, and those who are out in the country enter into it. Let me read the rest of the chapter here. Let me see. Enter, enter, enter into it uh, for the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, women who are pregnant, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, there'll be great distress and wrath against these people. This is because pregnant women will have a hard time getting around, and you'll be running a lot. You know, they'll fall by the edge of the sword and let captives among the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled to foot by Gentiles till the times Gentiles are fulfilled. It goes on and on and on, dealing with the signs of the end times. And that is the, uh, that's this particular seal that we were reading, but I think this is seal number six, right? He says, uh, I have here fleeing to mountains is something people who are wont to do when escaping danger. For example, if you read Genesis 19, the angel told Lot to flee to the mountains. Lot left for the city of Zor, but then he left Zor to go to the mountains out of danger. Jesus warned people to go to the mountains when the abomination uh, takes place. We just read that in Matthew 16. These are good examples of finding safety from human danger, but when the danger is divine judgment, there'll be no hiding place. What's happening? People going to the mountains and calling to the mountains, rock, saying, follow us and hide us. It won't work. There's no hiding from God's wrath. Are there any questions? <clears throat> any questions? No one has any questions? Okay, well, I want to thank everyone for participating and if uh, uh, you found this uh, uh, Bible study helpful, please like this, uh, like this video and subscribe to our channel for easier access to future videos. You can also join us for our prayer meeting, which is happening right now at the end of this video by clicking on the link that I have provided in the description below. I hope you could be with us. But if not, then I'll thank you and I'll see you in our next lesson.